So this is how it feels to lose someone to suicide. In the first moment, it's just a void. It's airless, lightless, senseless, hopeless. All you can feel is a crushing weight that presses out all potential light, air, hope, and sense. That first moment is a millisecond that lasts forever because it's timeless. In the second moment, you breathe and you say, oh my God, I'm still here. Oh my God, I'm alive. This person I love was dead, but I'm still here. And in that second moment, you grasp all that's been taken from you. And you say, what am I gonna do? How is this gonna work? If I'm still here, if I'm still living, how is this gonna work? And that second moment can also be a split second, and that also goes on forever. I was 11 when my father attempted suicide. He was 67, an older father. He was very accomplished, an author, a music critic, a man of great love and life. But he was addicted to sleeping pills and he was depressed and he took enough sleeping pills, my mother always said, he took enough to kill a horse. It didn't kill him though. It put him into a coma for nine days and when he came out, he went into a psych hospital for six months, pure talk therapy, never made another attempt. He had some dementia, some brain damage, but he never made another attempt. But when it happened, what I remember is my mother's face as she told me, it's not your fault. I remember her looking squarely at me, this fixed gaze. She was determined that I should understand this. It's not your fault, it's nothing you did. And I don't know at that age whether I believed her, was even capable of believing her. I don't know. I don't remember that part. What I remember is her telling me, it's not your fault. Then in 1992, 17 years later, my older sister Lucy, also a beautiful, accomplished, educated, classically trained pianist, she killed herself. She OD'd on psych meds. She had been sick for years. She had made one previous attempt. She finally, finally did it in 1992. She was 31, I was 28. And my mother and I knew enough to say to each other, we said to each other, it's not your fault. It's nothing you did. We both knew that we had loved her as well as we could, as much as we could, that we couldn't have stopped her from killing herself. We knew that we had tried and we knew that we had to say, it's not your fault. We also knew we had to try to believe it. I don't know that we did. Three years ago, my husband, Chris, my beloved husband of 20 years, leapt from the roof of a parking garage not far from here. He was also beautiful and accomplished. He was an author, a journalist, a man of great life and love, and still he jumped. For six months, he had spiraled into insomnia, anxiety, depression, and no nothing worked. And when he died, I told myself, only because I knew I had to tell myself, it's not your fault. I knew I had to say it. I also knew I would never believe it. I would never believe it. I would always have to say it because I knew the guilt would hit me. I knew the guilt would never leave, but I knew that the rational part of me had to recognize that the guilt was irrational. And so I told myself, and I still tell myself more than three years later, it's not your fault. The human, irrational, emotional part will always feel guilty. The rational part says, oh God, the guilt, it's not real. In the second moment, that second moment, when you realize all that you've lost, I remember this after my sister died and after my husband died. There's a paradox because you recognize all that you've lost and at the same time, it's the first moment of hope because you say, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm gonna keep moving forward through time and space. I'm gonna keep living. I'm going into a future without my beloved sister, without my beloved husband. 
You're supposed to go through life with your sister and your spouse. You're supposed to get old with them. You have all these shared memories with them from the past, but you're also supposed to continue creating memories with them. And I'd lost all of those future memories. But in the midst of that horror, that moment of horror was also the first moment of hope because I saw that I had a future. It was a future without my sister and my husband, but it was a future and it was terrifying. It's a terrifying thing to realize you're still here. How is that future gonna, gonna work? How am I gonna march into this future which has a scope I can't comprehend? I can't see it. All I can do is go through the moments. The first moment, the second moment, they return. They always come back at you. Third moment, tears and snot. Fourth moment, tears and snot. Fifth moment, laughter. If you're lucky enough to have friends who will laugh with you, you laugh. Every occasion, the weirdness just hits you, you laugh. The first week after my husband died, he died on a Monday, on Friday, I called Social Security to see about benefits for me and my three kids, right? So in the course of answering all these questions about my marriage and his death, I get asked this question. Have you remarried? Four days after my husband's suicide, I burst into laughter. It was a godsend. It was a bolt of life from the light from the darkness, light and life from the darkness, okay? That's all I could do. It all comes down to all you can do. I'm not an authority on grief. I'm only an authority on what happened to me, and I can tell you what I did. I got out of bed. That's actually a pretty big thing to do after a suicide. You get out of bed. I swore a heck of a lot. I cried, more tears, more snot. I laughed when I could. I got my kids out the door to school. I went to work, tried to go to work, tried to do whatever I had to do to get through each day. I talked, I talked a lot. I talked about the grief, the, the grief, the irrational guilt. I talked about all of that. I talked about anything that made sense to anyone who would listen. I talked about things that didn't make sense because we have to talk about suicide. I said aloud, I won't kill myself. I said that to my kids, I won't kill myself. That was something I could do, so it was something that I did do. And they had to hear it because we all have to say that to each other after a suicide because we all feel guilty. I made a list. It's gonna sound corny, but it was my list. So other people can make lists that sound corny to other people, but it made sense to me. It was a way of dealing with the lack of sense in my life and lack of order. Live. It's obvious, right? I'm still here. What choice do I have? Give. Got me out of my head. Got me to think and do something other than fixate on my own guilt. Love. That seems obvious, right? I'm gonna love my kids, I'm gonna love my family, I'm gonna love my friends, but after a suicide, it's a terrifying thing to still love because you could lose again. So I had to actively tell myself to love and to open myself to love, maybe even make new friends, new loving relationships, and that was scary. Laugh, thank God. Grow, because if I am still here, I can't be static. I have to look at myself, I have to keep changing if, if that's possible. Assess my own failures, flaws, foibles. Try to move on. Learn. It's related to grow. Again, anything that not so much got me out of my own head, but put other things inside my head besides my own guilt, the things I couldn't control. What could I control? Well, I could expand my world. I could acquire new skills. One of the things I did after my husband died was I started taking jazz violin lessons because I'd always thought about it. And I finally said, I'm gonna learn jazz violin. <laughs> and I still quite haven't, but I'm working at it. <laughs> pray. I'm Catholic, I pray. Someone else on their list might write meditate or read poetry or write poetry. For me, I wrote pray. <sighs> Be grateful, count my blessings. I can't control the horrors that have happened. What I can do is look at my beautiful children, my health, my life, my friends, my family, be grateful. Be present, it's all I have. I can't go into the past. I can't see into this terrifying future. 
make music, because again, I love playing the violin, it's healing, I like to sing, gets me doing and thinking about something other than that gnawing guilt. Have faith and stand up straight, because I'm a terrible slumper, and I need to remind myself constantly, stand up straight. <laughs> so as afterthoughts, at the bottom of this list, which I, I wrote out on a scrap of paper and stuck on my, my uh, fridge door, it's still there, I still see it several times a day. At the bottom I wrote, exercise, because it's a major mood elevator. And, and I also had to keep myself healthy for my kids. And finally, don't wear red in photos, because <laughs> I had a really unfortunate incident with a red raincoat in a photo, and I don't want to repeat it ever. <laughs> so I actually considered putting on a red shirt today, and I thought, no, no, no. <laughs> so this helped me control the uncontrollable, this list. Because the moments kept happening, the moments of tears, the moments of snot, the first moment, the second moment, they kept hitting me, and I couldn't control those moments. We have this idea, or rather hope, that grief will be orderly. We all have internalized the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross stages of grief. Uh, denial, anger, bargaining, um, depression, acceptance. And those are all components of grief, but in my experience at least, there's no order to them. Grief is a monster. It hits you whenever it wants to. It hits you, it hits you out of order. Sometimes it hits you with everything all at once. You think you're avoiding everything, then it all comes back and hits you. You think you're done with one component, like I'm done with the anger, and then six months later, you're throwing dictionaries around the room. <laughs> so in the midst of all that, you think, well, what can I control? I can't control that. And after a suicide, you control even less because you've got that awful guilt that just slams you. And you, it happens. And everyone who loses someone to suicide in the aftermath, I should have made a phone call. I should have said this instead of that. I shouldn't have said that at all. This is what I should have done. Oh my God. Something I could have done might have saved their life. Oh my God. That's, that's what happens after guilt, after suicide, the guilt. And the guilt happens after the guilt, too, so. <laughs> and on top of it, after suicide, aside from the guilt, you've got these unanswered questions. They're mysteries. They're utter mysteries. They're unanswerable. Why did my sister have to suffer so? Why did my husband have to suffer so? What might have changed in their treatment? What could we have changed in their treatment? putting them on meds, making sure they never went on meds. What, in my interaction with them, what might I have done? Why can't I go back? And why couldn't I do anything? How could I have stopped them? Why do people have to suffer? You can't answer those, because suicide never makes any sense. That's the horror of it. It never makes any sense. We want to make sense of things that happen to us, and we can't. And part of dealing with that grief is saying, I have no power over it. Not just I have no power over all that happened, but I have no power even over this grief. It's going to do what it does. What can you do? What could I do? What did I do? Well, I got the sense of life as a process of self-reinvention. I realized that I had to reinvent myself. Whether this was conscious, unconscious, a little of both, I don't know. But I had to figure out a new way of being. Because I had so little control over what happened to me, what happens to any of us, I had to focus on the things over which I did have control. It's like someone who loses a leg and first moves through space in a wheelchair and then on crutches and then finally with a new leg, a prosthetic. They learn how to move forward and it's the same after any trauma. You just have to re-figure yourself out. Your life has gone off, off script, so you have to play it by ear. And I did that with my kids. I'm still doing it with my kids. I'm still doing it with myself. My husband had a huge personality. Mine is not small, but his was huge. He was charismatic. He was the planner, the leader, the hatcher of, and, and instigator of adventures. He was the one who supervised chores. 
He was the one who really was firm about discipline. He was a huge personality. And I found myself trying to decide, like doing sort of triage, like, can I do this? Should I do that? What's the most important thing? Should I start trying to instigate adventures myself? How will I be in the aftermath? We all have to re reconfigure. One thing I did, my oldest daughter was on a gap year in Ecuador, and I took my younger two, the Easter after my husband died, to go visit her. And it was very healing. And it continues to be healing, this idea of moving forward and trying to learn new things at every stage with the people we love, and trying to be new people with the people we love. When I came back, I started writing this book, and I'd written a book after my parents and sister died, all within the same two years. And as with that book, this one became a way to kind of create my own narrative, to make my own self and what happened to me make sense. I had to tell my own story. I'm a writer, so I did it with a book. But you don't have to be a writer, I don't think. I think the creative process of sorting through grief is, is one of creating a narrative. And I found it enormously helpful. And I think that's all we can do, because there's so much out of our control in life. I, I can't go back in time and stop my husband from jumping. I can't do that. I can't go back in time and stop my sister from swallowing those pills and curling up on her bed. I can't go back and, and, and give her the phone number of where I was going to be that weekend so she could call me. I can't go back and give my husband a longer hug before he went off to work that morning. I can't ever get rid of my own guilt. I know that. I know it's going to hit me. I know it's irrational, but I know it's going to hit me. I can't ever answer the questions why that happened, had to happen to him. What on earth that could have been done? It's a mystery. All that I can do is keep plodding forward, taking the moments as they come, living each moment, choosing to live each moment to the fullest. And so I make dinner at night. I go over to the fridge and I see it. I can live. I can give. I can love. I can laugh. I can grow, I can learn, I can pray, I can be grateful, I can be present, I can make music, I can have faith. And if I remember to, which I usually don't, it's not very often, I can stand up straight. Thank you. <laughs>